Today I want to think about and consider the ultimate sacrifice. When you think about sacrifices, um, you know, you, you can't get a higher sacrifice. You can't get a higher cost than what Jesus paid in order for, uh, to take away our sins. If I had an opening statement, it'd be this, that the plan of salvation, or you say God's eternal purpose, was considered to be of such a great worth that both God and the Word were willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice in order for its obtainment. That, um, that, that's worthy of our consideration. Yes, amen. My objective in this, this uh, sermon is to make us more aware of the cost of our salvation and more appreciative of it. Amen. The scriptures reveal that there's one God there's one God who sits ensconced in the heavens, and he sits on a throne. He does whatever he wills. Whatever he wills to do, our God does. That, that's our God. He's, he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and, and his purposes cannot be frustrated. You can't overcome God. God overcomes everything that he comes up against. John reported in Revelation 4, verse 2 and 3, and immediately, talking about John, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat there was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. This is a very pleasant place, that is, if you're in agreement with God. See, John was in the spirit. So see, what, what he saw when he looked at the throne, remember this was like the first thing. Yeah, Along with the rise of democracy, I fear that modern man has lost somewhat of the understanding of what it really means to be ruled over by a sovereign Lord. I don't think Americans know what it means. Democracy is so has desensitized people to the thought that God is over them. They're going to have to answer to God. See, whether or not we know it or not, we stand before a holy God right now at this moment. He's right here. See, he's not very far away from every one of us. He's holy and he's righteous and he's doing his will now. Our God's more than that. And see, in salvation, he's divulging, he's opening up aspects of his nature that were previously unknown. And yet they were very much there. See, the very fact that, that men today have become desensitized to it doesn't change the fact that it's the way it is. God is sovereign. God does do what he wants to do in his universe. I didn't, I didn't even remember it was Father's Day, but this seems like this would be a good Father's Day message. Thank you. Speaking about the one true God, the Father of the universe. See, God's government is not a democracy. It's not a democracy. It's, it's, a, it's a theocracy. That's what it is. God does what he wants to do. If we're to properly understand the implications of standing before a sovereign king, one that has ultimate rule, one that has absolute rule, it's important for us to fill our hearts and our minds with the words of the king. I mean, we have a benefit, a great benefit. We have the words of the king. We know how he thinks. He's given, well, see, God's got to be merciful. If he would give us to give us to know how he thinks, how he reasons, what he likes, what he hates. This is a merciful God that he would divulge these kinds of uh, the revelations to us so that we can be prepared. Oh, this is a, we have a very good God. 
If men, uh, see this, we have to say these things because of the generation we're living in. But if men judge or evaluate God as they do men, they will always come to the wrong conclusion about God. God is not a man that he should lie. And this is in the scriptures. I'm just going to read this scripture. Neither the son of man that he should repent hath he said and shall he not do it? See, men say things all the time that they don't do. But God has never said something that he won't do. Amen. When God says something, he does what he says. When he promises Abraham, I'm going to make you the father of many nations. This is what he did. He was not pretending. God doesn't try to use trickery and language to try to get people to do what he wants. If God wants somebody to do something, he can make them do it. That's not a problem. Just ask Nebuchadnezzar. Just ask Pharaoh. Can God make you do something? Yes, he can make me do whatever he wants me to do. But see, this isn't where God gets a lot of glory. It's now when God works in them, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, and they willingly submit. See, this is what Christ came to show us, that there is no disadvantage in submitting to God. No disadvantage. In fact, there's a great advantage in laying down your life and taking up your cross and following after Christ. This is where the advantage is. But see, in an in a, in a arena that we're in right now, See, it, it has the appearance that you would be at some kind of disadvantage to, to forfeit your will. Well, yeah, we, have, a, we have, a, have received or obtained a much higher will in Christ Jesus. God doesn't make promises that he can't keep. That's another thing. We, I can promise you, and in the, in the heat of the moment, I can promise you something that really I can't give. I may not even be alive five minutes from now to do it. But see, we got to be very careful because we're men. But see, God, oh, God promises exactly what he wants to, what he wants to do already. Men have a tendency to think more highly of themselves than God thinks of them. Well, let's see, that probably wouldn't go over very well in some places, but that's the truth. I mean, just look at the flood. Now, God, God... He does what he will. Now, see, it is to our advantage to know that God desires to save men. This is what he desires to do. He said, for God so loved the world, he made, he made it a way for them to be saved. Remember in the garden? In the garden, God said, now. Remember, man had sinned. He had fallen. And God interjects, now, lest they put their hand forth and take of the tree of life. He cast them out of the garden. What is that revealing? It's revealing a merciful God. God's not on the initiative to, de to destroy men, but to save them, recover them. Why? Because aspects of his nature is going to be divulged during this salvation that's going to be, oh, marvelous things that angels have never seen. Principalities and powers in heavenly places have never understood these things, but God's demonstrating them in the church as he saves men. He's demonstrating Christ, who is our example, is he, Christ is talked about as the express image of God, which means that you can learn things from looking at Christ about God that you could never learn any other way. Christ is the express image. So you want to know what God's like? Just look at Jesus. Amen. Just look at Christ. How did he react? Look at Christ. This is exactly the way God would react. God was in Christ, reconciling men unto himself. Now look at what Christ did here. He didn't exalt himself. This isn't what Christ did. Christ, over and over, Christ would say things that would prove to you that he wasn't here to exalt himself. He was here to do the will of the Father. And he's our forerunner. He's the one that we, we learn how to serve God by looking at Christ and being transformed into his image. And then we're good, we're good servants of the Most High. And if anybody had the right, I mean, if, if you wanted to say, well, well, I got a right to do what I want. Christ would have been the one. He's the one that all power in heaven and earth was given unto him. But see now, he's, he didn't exalt himself. This isn't what he did. In fact, he humbled himself. I mean, he actually was the only man that had anything to boast in. 
And yet he didn't, he didn't exalt himself. Actually, Christ set aside. He set aside whatever privileges he had in order that he might humble himself, become a servant, and serve. Show us, what, what does it mean to serve God? Well, look at Christ. Look what he did. He taught us how to serve God. As we look into the scriptures, we find that God has always been. There's never been a time. See, we think in the realm of time because that's where we're at. But see, God's exempt from time. He's outside the realm of time. God's always been. I mean, you look at the scriptures. We have scriptures that talk like this. In Deuteronomy, the eternal God is thy refuge. Just one that it's always been. You can't teach God something. God's, he's God. See, God's going to teach us something. He's going to show us, to reveal something to us that we desperately need to know. That he is God. It's a comforting word to know that God's an eternal God. See, see, we're not, I mean, not in ourselves. We're born. There comes a time when we have a beginning. But he had no beginning of days. This is, this is a God. I mean, we, we're coming into the presence of God. See, it's, it's time to, to sit up and take notice when you know you're coming into the presence of the Most High, the eternal God. And this eternal God has a desire for you to know him. Oh, we can't be more blessed than this. Amen. Moses, Moses knew this. He's the one that said, talked about the eternal God. And underneath are the everlasting arms. See, you can't have a more secure salvation than you have in Christ Jesus. Because underneath, God, this is God's desire being worked out. This is the eternal God, the one that made everything, the one that everything was made for, his desires that you know him. Now what can stand in your way of knowing him? See, this is God, this is God we're dealing with. And so we come into this arena where God, God's the number one personality. God's the one that um, everyone has to conform to his will. Well, but it's right to do it. It's not like it's like it, God's making us, oh, God can, but see, it's, when you see it rightly, you want to do it. God's the only one that can really do what he wants to do. So yeah. when you see that he wants, to, he wants you to know him and he wants to give you this understanding, then you submit. Yeah. yeah. I want to know you too. And the closer I get, the more I, I see about you, the, the greater I see you are, the more I want you to show me who you are. Remember Moses, he says, show me your glory. Amen. He said, no, not yet. I'll show you the back parts. See, no man can see me and live. But see, Moses is with him now. See, Moses is in Christ now. Oh, see, this is it's a good desire. God didn't say, no, I'm not showing you nothing. Look at the things he showed Moses because he wanted to see it. He had a desire. Where did he get that desire from? Well, from God. He was exposed to God. So it shouldn't surprise us as we walk with Christ, who is the image of God, that we, we have this strong desire building up in us to be with God. I want to be with him. This one that has gone to great, great cost to bring me to glory. It's a comforting word. Now, talk about cost. We who live down here in the lowlands can sometimes have a, a, a lesser understanding of what kind of cost you're talking about when you're talking about God and cost. There's never been a time when God hasn't been God. Before the mountains were brought forth, this is in Psalms, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now, David saw it, but God is it. This is who God is. And I, I, I only say these things as a foundation because this is the one now that's going to give something up so you can be with him. So now it shouldn't surprise us for him to, at some point in time, ask us to give something up to be with him. It shouldn't surprise us. You know, and, and the way God's arranged things, 
we only have to give up things we can't keep anyway. I mean, everything that we have to give, we can't keep it. We have no power to keep it. And so God gives us an opportunity. He's made it by faith so the promise would be sure to the whole seed. Why? Because this is God. This is, he, his desire is that we be saved. And speaking about a cost, one needs a contrast or a system of values in order to understand to what degree something actually costs. I mean, if I say the refrigerator costs $500, but I only paid 50 for it, does it really, is it really worth $500? See, it's not. I know it's a silly thing, but if the widow gives two mites, that means nothing unless the one that has two mites gave it. <laughs> when you see that she gave two mites and you see that she gave everything, that's all she had was two mites. Now this means something to Christ. Somebody looking on and say, she only gave two mites. I mean, come on. But see, Christ knew this is all she had. Now see, I would be impressed then if a millionaire come up and gave all that he had. See, that would impress Christ. You give it all. But you see, the, the value says, if you're just looking at it, say, well, he gave $100,000. Isn't that great? The guy's a billionaire. Amen. So you see that costs can get confusing, and you can be, but see, God's never confused. God looks on the heart. He knows what you, see, he, he looked at her two mites like it was like two million because she gave everything. Now here would be my addendum to my opening statement if I had one. While it is true that there has never been a time when God was not God, there was a time when Christ or the Word was not in subjection to God. Not in the sense of now He is. Now I'm going to make a point throughout this message that the thing that Christ gave up was the dearest thing that he had. <laughs> I'm asking God to give me grace to do this because, see, really, until you have given up that thing that is dearest to you, God is not going to start opening things up to you. He's not going to do it. But when you do this, when you lay down your life, for him, I guarantee you, the road to glory will become much, much more real. Now remember, I'm speaking of this high cost. This is a high cost. Now, Jesus didn't look on being equal with God as something to be held on to. He didn't. He. He's. Thank you. He didn't. Um. He didn't look at. Equality with God to be something that would hold him back from doing what God asked him to do. He, he, he voluntarily submitted to this arrangement. All right? So both God and Christ are going to pay a price. Now, now, we have lesser examples to look at for love for our child, you know, and, and, and to be separated from them. But see... I know that you can see somewhat of it, but see, it's something is lost because that child was never a part of me like Christ was a part of God. See, this was, this, it, it's, it's much more personable than, than what we can fathom at this time, but we can see some of it. We can see Christ. And see, seeing him, you kind of get that, you, 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 can, you can sense that he... This is something that, that, that in the garden, he didn't, he didn't want to be separated from God. He didn't, he didn't, and yet at the same time, he wanted to do the will of the Father. So see, you see the dilemma he was in. He, he wanted to please God. He, he was on board, as it were, speaking as a man. And yet the cost was going to mean that he would have to be separate from God. And they said, well, it's only for a few hours. Oh, this is an eternity to someone who has always been one with the Father. And yet he, he went on with the plan. He went forward. Why? Because he loved the Father. So this was a high cost. In order for our salvation to be 
worked out. In order for sin to be taken away, a price had to be paid. Christ had to lay down his life in order that we might have life. See, we, we had offended God. We had, we had sinned against God, and, and it was impossible, absolutely impossible, for God to wink at sin. He, he couldn't do it. He's righteous. He's holy. So in his, in his wisdom, God comes up with a way that he can put away sin and salvage those that were made in his image, the ones who would believe, the ones who would come unto Christ, the ones who God would give him, different ways of looking at the same thing. And at the same time, Christ would come back. He would come back because he himself had no sin. So he would come back and see, not only did they pay a price, but there was a high return from that price. These two things, if they're not looked at at the same time, you'll kind of get a warped or a lopsided view of what happened. Christ and God both paid this immense price, but the yield from that cost, oh, I'm telling you, for all eternity, both God and Christ and the Holy Spirit are going to be rejoicing because of the great yield that Christ in his death, see, he purchased an eternal salvation. This is an eternal. This isn't something that's just going to last. You know, my car might last 10 years. This is something that's of a different order, of a different. Christ purchased souls for God. See, he, he purchased your soul. And, 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 and he, not only did he purchase it, he transformed it into his own image resulting in a, a, a mass that no man can number, that God at some point in time is going to move into a, a body for God, a habitation for God through the Spirit. This is, what, this is what Christ purchased for God. Now, see, they looked at it, and I'm, I kind of you know, thought of this in an analogy back in, the, in eternity past on the trestle boards of eternity, they work this whole thing out. Now, this is just thinking like a man. And they come to the conclusion. And the father looked at the son. And he said, will you go? And the son said, I'll go, father. Yeah, I'll go. It's, the cost. it's a high cost. I want to be real here. It's a high cost you're asking me to do, father. But I'll do it. Amen. Because look at, look at what the return's going to be. <laughs> See, this... Um, Technically, before time, before any of this was done, God was fully satisfied. He was fully complete, all-knowing, all-powerful. God didn't need anything. It wasn't like God was sitting there thinking, well, you know, if I could just have this and this, then I would be complete. God was absolutely complete. He was without need. But see, those personalities whom he has created... How is he going to get them to comprehend the fullness of what he is? See, now, a God this great needs to be known, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. what, 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 this God that's full of grace and full of glory and, and long-suffering and not willing that any should perish, how would they know that had God not had this plan, this eternal plan of redemption to where he would showcase his character, showcase his nature in such a way that principalities and powers in heavenly places would be able to look on to what God's doing on the earth and they would be able to comprehend, oh, this God, he's merciful. Well, we didn't get that when we looked at the fall of angels. We, we saw he was powerful. Oh, he just, he, Michael and the, his, his angels just came in and they just defeated the devil and they cast him out of heaven but they didn't see any mercy, not that day. But see, in man, he says, oh, no, these are my, these are created after my likeness. And they were created in his likeness for a purpose, that God might work salvation and divulge who he is. So God was fully satisfied with the plan. Christ was fully satisfied with the plan and the Holy Spirit, the whole Godhead was involved and bringing many sons to glory.
John 1.1 1, 1 gives us a little bit of a taste. And it's interesting how this is worded. More than interesting, this is how God wanted us to think. In the beginning was the Word. Now, I mean, it's a special note. That it doesn't say in the beginning was God because God was the Word. <laughs> in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. See, this is the way God wanted us to think about His Word. Amen. It was a part of Him. It, it obviously was because it did exactly. It never returned void, ever. It always accomplished the thing where He sent it to do. This is how he wants us to think about these things. The same word was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. This is, this is, you say, well, I wonder what it was in the beginning. This is how it was in the beginning. But at some point in time, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Remember? Why? Because, see, God, man had sinned, and by man, see, sin had to be, had to, a man had to die for sin. Not an angel, not a represent, representative from heaven, no, a man. So the Word became flesh. The Word was made flesh, which by necessity involved the Word laying aside specific aspects of his relationship with God. See, the word, as he is one with God, <clears throat> can't lay down his life. He can't die. So he had to be a man. He had to be made a man. And he had to have a special body, a body that could bear sin and die. A, bo a body that, that, that had never sinned. So he couldn't be from Adam's lineage, right? Yeah. Couldn't be. Because Adam brought sin and destruction to Adam's race. If you were connected to Adam, you were connected to the fall, and you had the propensity to sin in your members. Now, so it couldn't be a part of Adam's race. So how is God going to do this? Well, another stroke of wisdom. He says, a virgin shall conceive. Oh, yeah. The very one that he says in, in Genesis 3.15, this woman... My woman was going to be born the savior of the world. Isn't that genius? That's wisdom. That's God. But there was a catch to this. He would have to die. Now, you know, for all the ages, the, the, the God talking about this and God revealing what was going to happen couldn't really fully make the people appreciate it until the actual moment the Savior's right there and he's bearing sin and he actually, he's a real man with real feelings and he cries out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, God wanted us to know there was a cost for your salvation it wasn't free. All this talk of free salvation, I don't know who it's free to. It's not free to Christ. He had to pay a price It's not free to God. He had to send his son. The word had to become flesh. He had to be separated from that word in a sense that he had never been separated before. And it's not free to you. You have to take up your cross and follow after Christ if you want salvation. So see, I don't know what they're talking about when they say free salvation. Yeah, I didn't have to die for my sin, but if I'm going to get that, the, 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 the goodness that comes from salvation, I got to die to myself. Now, that's a cost. This wasn't just collateral damage, Jesus having to die. This wasn't just like, well, I, you know, he said, well, this has to happen, so let's just move on. This was very personal to Christ, to be separated from God. This was very, this touched him at his, at his most deepest part of who Christ was, that he was going to be separated from the Father. So, I mean, but he paid it, he did it. So now, in Philippians... We'll get to our text. And in Philippians, he says, let this mind, the one I just tried my best to describe to you, let this mind be in you. See, the same frame of mind that Christ had when he submitted to God, he agreed to this plan, and he laid down his life. That same kind of thinking, 
Let this work inside of you, Amen. which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. God asked Christ to give up infinitely more than he has asked you to give up. But see, to you, to you, who has to be the one to give it up, when he says, take up your cross and follow after me, to you, in comparison, it's, 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 it's equitable. Because, see, it's all you have. That's what he is asking for. Amen. That is what he's asking for. Everything you have. And if you will, oh, if you will, you will get infinitely more than you could have ever imagined. Amen. If you'll just lay down your life, then God will give you eternal life. Oh, this is, this is the gospel. You think about Christ, what a transformation it was. What a transformation to go from the courts of heaven to be in the one who all things were made by you and for you to being in the form of a servant. I can't, see, I can't, I can't comprehend that. I want to, but I've always been here. I've always been a sinner, as it were. When I was born, I was shaped in iniquity. So I, I don't understand it, but I understand it in reverse to some degree. I can understand when he said, your sins are gone and I've made you righteous. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like to have this hope build up in you to where you just can't wait to die and go to heaven. I know what that feels like. And to think that he had to do it in the reverse as it were. He had to lay everything aside in order for us to have that glory in us. being in the form of God, equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. See, this was on purpose. Could it be that it's just like on purpose when it is you picking up your cross and following after Jesus? It's on purpose. Amen. It's not like, oh, I got to pick up my cross again. I know I made this deal with God for me to come down and lay down my life, but here I am. That's not how Jesus died, and that's not how you'll die either. Yeah. Not effectively. Amen. When Jesus was in the form of a servant, he spoke these words. These are the words now that Jesus spoke when he was a servant. The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself. But the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. See, this is, how could Jesus talk like this? Because he's in the form of a servant now. See, Jesus knows where he's at. Jesus appreciates where he's at. Only because he knows what's going to come from where he's at. Right. It's not like Jesus is just come down to, to suffer because he loves to suffer so much. No, Jesus knows what's going to result from the suffering. And see, when you know what's going to result from your suffering, you'll enter into it. And you'll glorify God in all your sufferings. Now, it's not, no suffering for the present time is joyful. It isn't like we're just suffering mongers and we want to suffer. But when you see what's going to result from you submitting to Christ, you'll submit. You'll submit. When Je Jesus wanted us to know and understand that he was here to do what God commanded him to do. He wasn't here to do his own will. Over and over and over, Jesus would say, not my will, but his will. See, this is, this is the point. And in the garden, when it got really down to the, this is the moment that he came for, to lay his life down. That's when his suffering, it came to a head. And he asked his father, is there any other way? Any other way? Of course, there was no. The answer was no. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. He, he won. Jesus overcame being a man. You could overcome being a man too. Now how do, he gave us the perfect out. If you think about it, right? He gave us the perfect out. What are we going to do with this flesh that loves the, loves the sin? It loves, it's of the earth, earthy. Yeah. What are we going to do with this? Crucify the flesh. Hey. He gave us the perfect out. We kill it. We say no. So, well, uh, wait a minute. God really loved Jesus because he used to be the word and he, he's his son. 
This is what Jesus said. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life. Yes, yes. Why did God love Jesus? Because he did what he told him to do. That's what Jesus said. Right. I laid down my life so my Father loves me. I always do those things that please my Father. All right, so he's, he's given us the opportunity to enter into the same thing. How do you know that you love God? When you love his people? When you lay down your life for your brethren? Now you have confidence that you love God. I'm highlighting this point about Jesus being made in the form of a servant because, see, right now, we're not home yet. And we've been made in the form of a servant. We're servants of God. So, see, it's, it's actually good for us to think about Christ being a servant because he taught us how, to, how a, real, a good servant reacts. Romans 15, 3, this is how the Holy Spirit talks about Jesus when he was here in the flesh. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as is written, the reproaches of none that reproached thee fell on me. Christ took the brunt of the wrath of God when he was on the cross dying for our sins. These weren't even his own sins. They were our sins. But they fell on him. And he didn't. He didn't cry out. Remember it says he didn't cry out. Why? Because he understood what was going on. And neither will we when we understand what's going on. All right? Now, as I considered this, this is um, this price that Jesus paid. He was willing to pay it not just for a short time, Say, well, the time, he was, when he was here and he was a part of time, they, well, that's the only time. No, that wasn't the only time. Christ cho has chosen to take a lower seat, as it were, for all time, Amen. for all eternity. Amen. And because of that, God has highly exalted him. <laughs> Now look at this, Hebrews, no, I mean, uh, Hebrews 5, 5 to 10. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest. It's a lot like God, like Christ said, I can, I can make myself a high priest. No, that's, that isn't even how that happened. He said, but he that saith unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee, called the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. God's the one that did this. Christ didn't even seek that for himself. It was God that set this up. Amen. Not even Christ in all of his expansive and ever-increasing glory has sought to take a place in heaven that is higher than God. Not even Christ sought this. See, remember, Lucifer did seek that. This is what, this is what Lucifer sought. He sought to be higher. He, he, he wanted to be like the Most High. Hebrews 8, 1 says, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is a sum. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. God has given Jesus a name that is above all the names. Yet God maintains his all in all status. Well, why are these things like this? Because this, is, this was part of the cost of Jesus being, being made in the form of a servant. Jesus being made a man. 1 Corinthians 15, 27 says, For he put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. Why? Well, it tells us why. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Why? This was a cost. So you want to know what it cost for God to put away your sin? The Word had to be made flesh. Amen. Christ had to lay down his life, taking away the sins of the world. Then he had to ascend into heaven and sit down, not in the throne of God, at the right hand of the majesty on high. And he had to submit himself unto God. 
That was the cost. God, it, and this is categorically stated. I'm not making this up. God is the head of Christ. But he has set Christ as the head of the church. <laughs> it, gets, it gets better, doesn't it? God has, has it said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. That's what Christ said. Ephesians 1.21 says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in which is in the world to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So God has maintained his godship, as it were, God's never left heaven. God, uh, speaking as, in, in a more perfect sense, God's always been on the throne. He sent the word into the earth to take away sin. Jesus took away sin, rose from the dead, ascended back up, and then he sent the Holy Spirit down. <laughs> and he's with us to this day. And he's getting us ready for when Jesus returns and they were all going to be caught up Amen. together with him in the air. And so shall we, shall we ever be with the Lord. And so, and then... See, we're going to reign with Christ in his throne. Oh, this is a good thing. God's given everything to Christ. Now, we have a few examples of this. I'm only going to mention one because of the time. In Genesis 41, 38, we're given to see and understand somewhat what he's talking about here. When Pharaoh was led of God to make this decree about Joseph. This is, this is the type of what I'm talking about. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God has showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. Now see, we got that type. Pharaoh saw, and obviously God gave him to see these things, that Joseph was the one, that he's the man. So he put him over all of his house, just like God has set Christ over all of his house. See, he's a, he's a, he's a righteous servant. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned set in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be filled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit now this is something that was absolutely required if god was going to demonstrate specific and previously unknown aspects of his nature to principalities and powers this had to happen sin had to be put away christ had to be at the right hand of god interceding for his people holy spirit had to be in them opening things up revealing it to him See, all of these things had to be done, and if, that is, if these principalities and powers in heavenly place are going to look at it and say, oh, this is God doing this. This is God working. And, of course, they did. He counted the cost, and he deemed it worthy. Now, you know, in Luke 14, 28, I won't read all this, but he, this is what Jesus taught us to do. He says, for, for which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down and first count the cost. If you're going to build a house, you sit down and you say, do I got enough money to do this? Do I got enough resources to do this? Well, it's like God and the Word and the Holy Spirit sat down and <clears throat> come to this conclusion. We can do this. It's just speaking as a man. They went, on, they went forward with the project. And in the end, see, we're, we're, we're not at the end of the plan. <laughs> We're, we're, I don't even know exactly where we're at. It was not given unto us, no. But we know one thing. There is an end. And he has divulged what that end's going to be, hasn't he? We're going to be ever with the Lord. We're going to, he said, that if you're willing to suffer with me, then you'll reign with me. Now, I'm, I think that's like an offer. What do you think? It's like an offer. Are you, are you willing to suffer with Christ? Because if you do, then he'll make you ruler. See, he'll, he'll, you'll reign with him. So see, I, he offers it this way because see, it's, a, it's a way for God to be glorified. Who's going to accept that offer? Those who want it. 
<laughs> Who's going to come forward and say, I'll live for God for the rest of my life? Those who want to. But see, God says, he speaks very prophetically, he says, my people shall be willing in the day of my power. So see, this is something that God's in control of this whole thing. But see, we're, we're involved in it. Salvation is not like I'm going to make you do something. Do you want to? Do you find in yourself a desire to please God? This is not like something that just fell out of the tree. God's working in you, drawing you into himself. So if you want to, come to Christ. Do it. Because if you will, he'll, he'll bless you. He'll bless you. He'll, he'll give you um, to be conformed into the image of his son. Why? Because on that day then, you'll, be, you'll enter into the kingdom of God. This world is just a temporary thing. I mean, have you ever noticed that none of our plans seem to work out? We're living under a curse here. We're living in a time of trouble. But even in the midst of all this trouble, there's this wonderful salvation that God's working in the midst of the earth. We don't have to be distracted by the world. We don't have to be. We can decide, no, I'm going to set my sights on things above. I'm going to walk by faith and not by sight. And in, in doing that, you'll get the grace to be able to deal with all these things that are around you. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Why? Because of the, what was going to come from it. I mean, you get so specific and you start going into the details, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but, but this, when he made himself into the form of a servant, the, the, there was going to come a time when God was going to have to make his soul an offering for sin. That's how personal it got. Christ submitted to his soul being made an offering for sin. Why? Why would he do that? Because the glory was worth it. What was going to come was worth it. Amen. And the whole reason why I'm... I'm in an attempt to, 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 and I know all your brothers see it, but see, this is, needs to be verified. It needs to be confirmed over and over to us that what the price you're paying right now, the cost you're paying when you pick up, pick up your cross, it's worth it. Amen. When you get there, believe me, you won't be looking back and saying, I can't believe I had to give up that old nasty world. No, that's not what you'll be saying. You'll be praising God that he actually gave you eyes to be able to understand that I was, I was, I was, Walking to heaven, but he was really carrying me. He brought me here. See, we'll cast our crowns at his feet, right? right? We'll cast our crowns at his feet. What does that mean? That means you acknowledge that you brought me here. You did the work. Yeah. Just like Jesus said, you're the one doing the work. Jesus was really the one here suffering. But God was in him doing the work. And God, if you're picking up your cross and carrying it, God's in you. And he's doing the work. He's helping you. Now, I want to be quick in closing to add that what God in Christ received as eternal compensation for what they gave up was much greater than what was forfeited. So I don't want to leave you thinking that it was just a cost that didn't earn interest. Oh, this, this is going to earn eternal interest, one that doesn't diminish. Well, my... Objective in this sermon was to highlight the cost of our salvation. I pray that as you consider these things, the salvation that you've received will become more and more yeah. valuable to you. Amen. Thank you, brethren.